Hi, Stephen P. Brown here. Thanks for joining me today on another episode of Audience Insights. I'm really excited about today's episode because I'm going to take you from a place of the to understanding why you should go and see this piece of music as soon as you possibly can. Which piece of music is Debussy's La Prémédie d'Enfant? And it's a wonderful piece. We're going to talk about the piece itself, talk about the composer, why it was written, and we're actually going to explore some very interesting aspects about performing this piece. We're going to hear from a flute player later on. So, let's start. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to look at a piece of music today by the French composer Claude Debussy. It's called La Prémédie du Fond, uh, The Afternoon of a Fond. Debussy lived, um, was born in Paris in 1862, and he also died in Paris in 1918, during World War I, as it was being attacked by the Germans. By the way, all this information is on my data sheet here. If you want to get a copy of this, I'm going to tell you later on how to get a copy. But first of all, we'll just go through the composer's life bit about the history of the music, the context, and whether or not um, I like this piece of music. Debussy himself, he actually studied at the Paris Conservatory. He spent most of his life in and around Paris. He did go to Rome for a couple of years, and he went to Germany to see some of Wagner's music as well, which made a big impression on him. Um, but most of his life was in Paris. This piece of music itself was written in 1894, and it was actually intended to be the first movement of a trilogy of pieces. There were supposed to be three pieces, three movements, but what happened was, as Debussy was sketching this, as he was writing down his ideas, he came across the poem, Afternoon of a Fawn, same title, um, by Stefan Mallarmé. And what actually happened was, Debussy combined his musical ideas into one movement, it's a 10 minute piece, and, that's, and he named it after the poem. So that's how we ended up with this piece of music there appears to be no tonal center in Beethoven, in Mozart, in most music, particularly modern pop songs, we have a tonal center, a, a key, a tone, which the piece revolves around. Debussy in this piece didn't do that at first. It, was, it wanders around a bit. You can't find the tonal center, and that's very remarkable. It's one of the first times this happened. Both Leonard Bernstein and Pierre Boulez have said that this particular piece has changed the course of musical history. There's a great reason to go and listen to it. Um, 18 years after it was premiered in 1894, Serge Diaghilev of Ballet Russe, he asked Nijinsky, a, a very famous dancer, to set this piece of music to choreography. The ballet itself made this music very, very famous. That's where most people came across the music, was through the ballet. The ballet hasn't survived. You don't see it performed very much these days, but the music itself continues to be played an awful lot. And you'll see why when you go to a concert and listen to it. Now, I contacted my friend Sarah Barashberger, um, who is a flute player, and I asked her what was special about this particular piece of music. And she came back with a wonderful explanation of what goes on just in the first four bars. It's the most famous and difficult passage regarding breathing and tone color, supporting the sound with the breath and focusing on the sound. If a conductor permits it, the flute player can play this in a very relaxed, dreamy atmosphere. But whilst they're doing so, they really have to focus on the quality of sound they're producing. In musical terms, that's called timbre. If the flute player doesn't actually pay attention to that, as Sarah said, it can sound like a foghorn. Another thing about this piece of music is the vibrato in the first four bars. As the flute player is playing, you may hear some vibrato, but you may, it may be a little bit imperceptible. It should be just like a nice soft opera singer. Um, if you can hear way too much vibrato, then uh, that ruins the atmosphere of the piece. And another thing Sarah said, it, she t reminded me of the nickname of this piece of music afternoon on the phone. Let's look at the context in which this piece was created. Um, some of the other composers writing at the same time was Albanius who wrote um, for a famous guitar concerto, 
Paul Ducard, who wrote The Sorcerer's Apprentice, made famous by Disney's Fantasia, that's the one with Mickey Mouse. Um, Manuel de Fire, he wrote um, a couple of very famous operas, Maurice Ravel, or Maurice Ravel. His most famous work was actually a, a, an exercise. It wasn't intended to be a performance piece, but it was an exercise, and that's Bolero, made famous by Dudley Moore in the film 10, uh, the show Blast, it's, Bolero's played all the time. Uh, ice skaters as well. And Respighi with the, with the uh, who wrote The Pines of Rome, The Fountains of Rome, some, a couple of operas, they were all writing at the same time. What was going on in the world at the time? Well, the first battery-operated telephone switchboard was installed and used in Massachusetts. 1894 was the first time that Coca-Cola was served in a bottle. Until then, it was just as a pump, um, as a syrup in a, in a bar. But 1894, they put it in a bottle and sold it. Manchester City Football Club was formed in England. A meteor shower was seen in southern France. Queen Victoria, also in 1894, she opened a canal that connected the sea to the city of Manchester in England. It was no longer landlocked. This was the first time that women could vote in Australia. And Petropolis became the capital of the state Rio de Janeiro. The Lyrical, International Lyrical Theatre in Milan opened, the National College of Music in London was formed, and the Peabody Museum at Harvard University, they had a project down at the Copan, which basically did all the excavations of the Mayans in Honduras and Guatemala. That project actually finished in, 1890, in 1894. Some of the literature um, at the time was Zola's Lord, uh, Jules Verne wrote Captain Antifa, George Gissing in the Year of Jubilee, The People of Mist. Uh, some of the artwork that was going on was Farewell Europe by uh, Sokachewski. Mrs. Patrick Campbell was painted as uh, Paula Tanqueray uh, by Solomon. Illustrations to Oscar Wilde's Salome were painted or created by Aubrey Beardsley. Among the Homeless was painted by uh, Cedarstrom. The most fascinating piece of information for me was that 1894, the piece La Primitive d'Enfant was written, was the same year Arthur Conan Doyle published The Memoirs of Sherlock Holmes. Same year. I had no idea. Um, Debussy was a very prolific composer. He actually wrote a lot of stage works, a lot of choral works, quite a few orchestral, including a big piece called La Mer, which is both orchestra and choir. He wrote some concertos, lots of chamber music, and quite a bit of piano music, piano solos. Two very famous ones, The Sunken Cathedral, probably the most recognized piece after Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, is Claire de Lune. Victor Borger made it very famous, that was his theme tune, and it was also the piece used in Frankie and Johnny, the movie. That was by this composer Debussy. Another fascinating thing, Johannes Brahms, Beethoven's successor, if you like, in the symphony world. He was still writing in 1894, he was still composing, he wrote his two clarinet sonatas. That fascinates me that Debussy, so modern, no tonal centre, was writing at the same time that Brahms was still writing. Basically, what do I think? Well, this is a very exotic piece, which um, if you allow it, it can take your thoughts and your dreams to places that you may not have considered before, if you allow it. Um, it's a very warm piece, it's very picturesque, which is why it works as a ballet. And another interesting thing to listen for, after the first four bars of the flute, when you're paying attention to that, watch the percussionist sitting at the back. See how long it takes him to actually play his music and count how many notes he plays. I think you'll be surprised. He actually plays an instrument called uh, some cymbals in this piece. It's a very dreamy, soft piece, but he does play cymbals. But these cymbals are so small, they're actually called finger cymbals because you actually use them on your fingers. It's a little fun thing. Do stay alert. Don't fall asleep in this piece because it is fascinating. And basically, I like this piece of music. So now that you're armed with some very insightful information into this piece of music, its history, its background, how it's played, the difficulties some of the performers have, things to listen for and watch for during a performance, just wallow in the imaginative context that this piece has and talk about it during the intermission or after the concert. Find someone to talk through this piece. What I'll do 
is I'll, um, if you want this data sheet, I'll include some talking points, three or four points that you can actually use to start a conversation. Very easy to get my data sheets, just hit the subscribe button below and I'll send them to you straight away. Just remember there could be some very well educated people in the audience with you as well as some people who are there for the first, second or even third time. Just be a bit sensitive of who you're talking to and whether or not they know what's going on. These talking points I'll give you, if you get the data sheets, will help you uh, start a conversation and let them talk. Remember you have two ears and one mouth, you should be listening twice as much as you talk. I'd really like to know if you found today's episode interesting, if you find a, a concert with this piece of music and, and whether or not this episode helped you enjoy and get a lot more out of this performance than perhaps otherwise would. It only takes a second to leave a comment below, tell me if you enjoyed today's episode, let me know if there's another piece by Debussy you want me to explore, otherwise I'll see you next week right here on another episode of Audience Insights. Remember. There's more to music than just the music. So take your new awareness, take your understanding, go and share it with somebody and go to a concert. For his cantata called The Prodigal Song, sorry, <laughs> he won the Prix de Rome for his song, it's another name for cantata, called The Prodigal Song.